Hi and welcome to the latest upload. Today I want to look at the connection and the dots between NASA and the signing of the Antarctica Treaty and why NASA seems to be the global authority behind all things space. But more than that, I want to tell you of a war that was not removed from the history books since it was never entered into them in the first place. And yet this war had taken place within our parents' lifetime and ours. And if you did not notice, keep listening. See you on the other side. I'd like to start this episode with a quote from Albert Einstein. The most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and all science. He to whom his emotions is stranger, who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe, is as good as dead. His eyes and mind are closed. So all I ask is that you keep your mind and your eyes open and see for yourself by the end of this video exactly what you think about it. And as usual, don't forget to subscribe, like and comment. And I'll look forward to uh, seeing some of your comments down below. So let's get started. You'll see by the end of this video that what we term as reality is completely different for the chosen few. I'm going to take a look at the dates which these modern day authorities such as NASA set themselves up. Those people involved and the possible reasons behind the space race. If in fact the space race should even be our focus of attention. So let's get started. I've mentioned previously NASA is in fact the global authority for all things pertaining to space. And as you can clearly see by the underlying snake tongue chevrons branding, they do appear and the divisions we the general public see between nations is nothing more than a smokescreen political theatre to keep the masses divided while the global powers keep some of the greatest secrets from view. So let's have a look. NASA was formed, or more accurately morphed, into NASA from the late 1957s to 1958. The already existing National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, began studying uh, a new non-military space agency and what that would entail, as well as what its role might be, and assigned at the same time, several committees to review the Cognautics, or NACA, began studying uh, a new non-military space agency and what that would entail, as well as what its role might be, and assigned at the same time several committees to review the concept. The NACA organised a special committee on space technology headed by a guy called Guyford Stever. Now, Stever's committee included consultation from the Army Ballistic Missile Agency, the large booster program, referred to as the Working Group on Vehicular Programs, headed by World War II German scientist Werner von Braun, brought to the US, as you probably know, under Operation Paperclip. And for those of you who may not know it, DARPRA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, was also created at the same time to develop space technology for military application. So we now have a date of 1958, which according to the records show NASA and DARPRA were formed at that time. Now, the reason for these two entities was supposed to in response to the Sputnik threat during the Cold War and as most of you know the creation of both these bodies also came about at the same time as Operation Deep Freeze between 55 and 56 as it was sold to the public as part of a multinational collaboration for the International Ge Geophysical Year and it was commanded by the now famous Admiral Byrd the US Navy Operation Deep Freeze uh, was to last two years and established permanent Antarctic bases at McMurdo Sound and the Bay of Wales at the South Pole. And remember, this was Byrd's last trip to Antarctica and marking the beginning of a permanent US military presence in Antarctica. And Byrd spent only a week in Antarctica on that particular trip and started his return to the United States. Byrd spent only a week in Antarctica on that particular trip 
and started his return to the United States on February 3rd, 1956. Now, the reasons for me giving you this information on Emerald Bird will become apparent in uh, as we go along. But let us jump back a little to the end of the Second World War. And this is where it gets really interesting, which may help us to get a slightly different perspective on why NASA and ARPA were created. So my research indicates is that it could have been in response to events that you're already familiar with, but you might not have connected the dots. But the response as we go a little further back, um, you may recall that the United States mounted a huge expedition to Antarctica called Operation High Jump. This wasn't the first time the US went to Antarctica. Uh, as early as the 1800s, scientific teams from several countries were trying to explore, map and gain dominion over the last uninhabited continent. But the size of Operation High Jump exceeded all others. More than 4,000 US personnel, plus dozens of aircraft and ships, were sent as part of an expedition led again by Admiral Richard Byrd. Although the mission was intended to last six to nine months, it ended abruptly after just four weeks. Now, many still believe it ended because the contingent, the, the, everybody was being constantly bombarded by artillery and the men sustained heavy casualties. Bird was quoted in the Chilean press saying that they were met by a new enemy that could fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds. Though the US would not confirm this information and what's more, several reports exist of pilots seeing UFOs flat, dislike aircraft that chased but never shot at them. They also reported balls of light that followed their planes. The pilots called them Foo Fighters, and these UFOs were supposedly able to shut down their planes' bombing capabilities. A place called New Schwabenland, the secret Nazi base built in the 1930s, and it was bragged about by the German Grand Admiral Karl Donitz in 1943. Did all the brilliant but twisted scientists involved in the Nazi atrocities really hunker down in the frozen desolation of the South Pole and continue inventing new weapons unseen by the world? We may never know. Or to make contact with extraterrestrials who shared their advanced technology? These are some of the speculative questions that have been asked down the decades. They're not necessarily my opinions. But the official story from the United States regarding Operation High Jump is that only one plane crash killing three pilots. And it's true the Nazis did mount their own expedition to Antarctica in around 1938, though they didn't take enough personnel to build much of anything, let alone a technologically advanced base capable of creating UFOs. But then, of course, the historical evidence, or should I say statements, would state that the Germans you know, did not have the resources to build such weapons, let alone flying saucers. But I'm of the opinion that they did not need to take all the resources with them since on previous expeditions, long before the war had, that had been established, the Second World War, this, there were advanced resources in the area, possibly from a pre-freezed, frozen civilization that could be easily taken for alien technology. But I'm reminded of the saying that any race with sufficient technological advances would seem magic or alien. So we have the mainstream media of the time saying we're in a Cold War, which I find slightly ironic, considering we're talking about Antarctica. The formation of both NASA and DARPA were in response to the Sputnik threat, according to the press of the day. But then, on the other hand, you have the reports from Antarctica about being attacked by craft. According to Admiral Byrd, which again, which again, that he stated that it can fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds. So, given mainstream media, for all intents and purposes, is a mouthpiece for the establishment of public opinion rather than reporting of news, it seems fair to assume that the latter is more likely a response to a global threat previously unknown, i.e., Operation High Jump. So. Keep this in mind as we take a look at the signing of the Antarctica Treaty and when and who were the original signatures on the bottom of that treaty. The main treaty was opened for signature on December the 1st, 1959, entered into force the following year. The original people that signed it were the 12 countries active in Antarctica during 1957 and 1958. The 12 countries that had significant interest in Antarctica at the time were Argentina, Australia, Belgium, Chile, France, Japan, New Zealand, Norway, South Africa, the Soviet Union and the United Kingdom and obviously the United States. 
Now, considering at the time the United States was in the middle of a Cold War with the Soviet Union, but they were really pally-pally with them down in uh, the South Pole and sat around a table and signed a treaty. There's a bit of a duality of reality going on down there, if you ask me. Let's just quickly jump back to those dates again, because they do... Uh, bear an important part of this. 1947, Admiral Richard Byrd led 4,000 military troops from the US, Britain and Australia in an invasion of Antarctica called Operation High Jump. Uh, sorry, an expedition. And that fact is undeniable. But the part of the story that is seldom told, at least in official circles, is that Byrd and his forces encountered heavy resistance to their Antarctic venture from flying saucers and had to call off the expedition slash invasion invasion. So that was 1947. 1955 to 56, Operation Deep Freeze again with Admiral Byrd. 1956 to 58, NASA and DARPA formed. 1958 to 61, Antarctica Treaty signed by those countries initially and has now expanded to 53 countries over the globe. But of the original 12, you'll note they were all allies against the Germans and all of them had lost troops back in 47 as part of the expedition called Operation High Jump. Now for the Deltas amongst you, and I don't understand why you would be on my channel if you were, but on the 5th of March 1947, so that's 1947 again, I wonder if you uh, can remember what else happened famously now in the annals of history uh, in 1947. But on the 5th of March in 1947, the El Mercurio newspaper of San Diego, Chile, had a headline article on board Mount Olympus on the high seas, which quoted Admiral Byrd in an interview with Lee Venata. Admiral Byrd declared today that it was imperative for the United States to initiate immediate defence measures against hostile regions. Furthermore, Byrd stated that he didn't want to frighten anyone unduly, but that it was in a bitter reality that in case of a new war, in the continental United States would be attacked by flying objects which could fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds. Interestingly, not long before he made these comments, the Admiral had recommended defence bases at the North Pole as well. And these were not isolated remarks. Admiral Byrd later repeated each of these points of view resulting from uh, what he described as his personal knowledge gathered both at the North and South Poles before a news conference held for the International News Service. Straight after the second uh, claims that he lies and was not allowed to hold any more press conferences. But in March 1955, he was placed in charge of Operation Deep Freeze, which was part of the International Geophysical Year 1957 to 1958 and exploration of Antarctica. He died shortly thereafter in 1957, and even then many have suggested he was silenced uh, or murdered by the state. Obviously being a suggestion that he was murdered by the state is only that, it's just a suggestion. As far as I'm concerned, uh, he died in 1957, but it does seem a bit of a coincidence that he died when that particular man of honour, as he was known for, uh, would not be silenced by the powers to be, given what he already knew. So the question is, who was the enemy that owned and flew these flying objects? Germany was apparently defeated and there was no evidence that the new emerging enemy Russia certainly had such superior technologies. They were, like the United States, only on the verge of the rocket age and totally dependent upon technology and expertise captured from Germany at the end of the war. There was no other threat that could have accounted for the United States' invasion of Antarctica, nor for the development of any craft that could fly from pole to pole under such incredible speeds as Admiral Byrd stated. Now, of course, we can't mention 1947 and Operation High Jump without taking note of the year. And of course, the Roswell incident had been in the news in the past summer, but had been officially explained and hushed up by the authorities uh, by the time High Jump Operation High Jump had actually begun. But it seems a bit coincidental that Operation High Jump and the Roswell incident describing a craft of that could travel of incredible speeds may well have come from the same base, the same source. Well, but I'll get to that a little bit later, to that a little bit later. 
I've located an old piece of video footage here of the scripted interview just before the start of Operation High Jump, and I do mean scripted. Note the reasons, yet all of the craft and the personnel were military. Personally, they needed the public reason to send so many troops and so much equipment to the South Pole, and this public exhibition was the only way they could hide the fact that it was a military operation that sought to remove an unknown threat which had advanced technology spilling over from the Second World War. I'm not going to include the whole video, just a few clips so you can understand the scale and how scripted it certainly was. Thumbs up to this gentleman. The Secretary has approved our plans. Confirming you, Admiral Byrd, as the officer in charge of the expedition and you, Admiral Cruzen, as the task force commander. And we get everything we need. That makes Operation High Jump the greatest polar expedition in history. Admiral, time is going to be our greatest handicap. By the time we get through this very difficult ice pack, the summer will have ended and the fall will have set in. Never before has anyone attempted to take a fleet of thin-skinned steel ships through 300 miles or more of crushing ice pack. I have great faith in your skill Courage and determination. And now, gentlemen. Admiral Nimitz reviews the operation's plan. The expedition will comprise three groups. A central land plane group to explore the interior from Little America, and two seaplane groups, the eastern to map that half of the continental shoreline, and the western to map the opposite coast of Antarctica. So there you have three wooden actors describing that they're going on a mapping and exploration expedition and yet you've already seen the uh, problems and challenges they ran into when 4,000 troops arrived. So you decide. But let's just get back to uh, connecting the dot. Background of Antarctica with the dates which seem to cover just a few short years between them. And it seems to me that Operation Paperclip was the not so much the Allies removing the brains from the Nazis' technology programs, but those brains as it were, von Braun and his associates in the German science division, uh, they simply didn't agree with Hitler's view of what the world should be like and how to get there. So I guess a new life for them and new technology for the USA, but it would be a few years before the United States would catch up with what they had faced with Admiral Byrd down on the South Pole. So if it was the Germans, the establishment of this Allied Treaty of Antarctica effectively landlocked any German attempts at expanding their ideas for any type of world domination. The treaty also ensured that the reasons for Operation High Jump would never be truly known to anyone but those in charge. Those nations currently who have their own space agencies all report directly to NASA. And I believe the Antarctica Treaty was the forerunner to a global agreement in keeping lesser nations and the general public out of the area that was frozen with ancient technology completely intact. The advances by Germany during the war may have woken the Allies up to the fact that they were years behind what the Germans had created. But a little known fact is this. I mentioned the Roswell incident a while back, and as you all know, it took place in 1947. As if Admiral Byrd stated in the press, these craft could fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds. There are those who believe the crash at Roswell was in fact one of these crafts from the South Pole and it was reportedly flown by German military pilots. And the stories put out by various agencies over the years, including the now famous Greys being captured, was a deliberate attempt to cover the real threat of a German invasion with advanced technology. But I guess again we may never know, the never know the truth, but the dates seem to fit with the activities of Operation High Jump and the subsequent retaliation by forces unknown down at the South Pole. Now, if you think this is all just crazy speculation and notion, just note that from the records in the public domain, and I'll read you one of them, Late on Friday night, February the 25th, 1942, something triggered anti-aircraft alarms and air raid sirens across Los Angeles. A blackout was called, a searchlight pierced the night sky in search of Japanese attackers and the reports came in of an unidentified object floating off the coast of Los Angeles. The army artillery went on the offensive for an hour beginning at approximately quarter past three in the morning on February the 26th. Troops fired more than 1,400 shells 
but were unable to shoot down the object. The shells exploding may have been mistaken for enemy planes. And yet, no enemy planes or UFOs were hit by American shells, and eventually the blackout order was lifted and the president was notified. At first, the war secretary at the time, Henry Stimson, claimed that 15 aircraft were involved in the battle. Then, officials said it was simply a false alarm. Eventually, the army claimed that the object was, here we go guys, a weather balloon. Just like the one in Roswell, sparking suspicions of a cover-up that continues to this day, and I'm not surprised. But closer to the events that forced the American government and its allies to mount what they called an exploratory expedition to the South Pole so soon after the end of the Second World War announcement. I mean, I know it's crazy to think that just because the authorities say, whoa, V for victory day, end of the war, and we all believe that it was actually the end of the war. But as we've subsequently found out decades and decades afterwards, that we can't always believe what the press and their authorities tell us. It may well just have been that the Roswell incident, along with the Los Angeles incident, was a continuation of the uh, opposing forces that Admiral Byrd had met when he went down to the South Pole. But let's pick another one. Again, 1947. Harold Dahl reported seeing six flying saucers shaped like donuts flying high above Puget Sound near Maury Island. Dahl claimed that one of these saucers exploded and that the debris struck his boat and injured his son. He was shown evidence of the debris to his employer, a guy called Fress Chrisman in uh, Washington. Not long after the incident, though, Dahl reported that a man in a black suit threatened him and destroyed his photos. Eventually, he recanted after the FBI public denied his story, but the uh, Maury Island incident has already captured the imagination. And at the same time, a few days after that he claimed he saw the sources, and two days before he and Christman reported them, a businessman pilot named Kenneth Arnold, which you probably already heard of, saw nine strange flying objects over Mount Rainier, Washington. A second man, a prospector on the ground, reportedly saw the same objects at the same time. Seems like 1947 was a really busy year. Arnold estimated that the flying saucers were speeding along at approximately 1,700 miles per hour. He suspected the crafts were experimental military aircraft, but the military denied that there was any aircraft conducting any test flights at the time in that area. But according to Arnold, the military asked him not to speak about the flying saucers. After the Roswell incident and several other flying saucer reports, the Air Force began investigating and officials found Arnold and a prospector's UFO site incredible, but attributed it to a mirage this time. Perhaps it was swamp gas or a mirage of a weather balloon. Who knows? Again, same year, on July the 8th, which you've all come to know now, come to know now reports came out from the Roswell Army Field that a flying disc had been recovered from a ranch near Roswell. With the other saucer reports of 1947, word spread before the Army could get in front of it. The events that followed would lodge stories of UFOs and alien encounters deep in the psyche of a public, which we still know today. But all these events are so close together, one might assume that they were all related to a single source. And when we also uh, take note that the source was based where the American naval fleet were now headed to the biggest manned expedition, which remember lasted far shorter of the planned time frame due to them getting their asses kicked with what was described as the same craft as seen and captured just two months before at Roswell. I mean, any person with any credibility, it, it does sound like a secret war was being played out. But obviously, that's just my speculation. But given these incidents, um, there seems to be an awful lot of activity just at the end of the war. Let me rephrase that. Just at the end of when the media told us the war had actually ended. As you saw from the video of Admiral Byrd there with um, these two other guys that were going down on Operation High Jump to map Antarctica and share with the world the results. Interesting enough, um, the public reasons given when they were going to map the southern regions with over, remember, 4,000 staff and planes with magnometers. And yet upon return, all the data was marked as top secret by the government and never revealed to the public. A bit of a switcheroo again there. 
So given the signatures on the uh, Antarctica Treaty and the likely base of operations of these craft that could fly from pole to pole at such high speeds in 1947, and obviously the advanced technology, which could have, let's be honest, and obviously the advanced technology, which could have, let's be honest, at any time destroyed any and all opposition. And yet those advanced technological forces didn't. So something must have changed and something must have been agreed. And I believe that that something was the realisation that Germany may have had advanced technology, but they had found it, stolen it, or simply had an agreement with those who actually owned it and who were already occupying Antarctica. I also suspect that the advanced race that um, remained in Antarctica to this day sent um, warning craft to the largest military power on Earth, the United States, and basically said, keep off our land and we will leave you alone. They may have even shared technology, but one thing is clear. All the signatures on the treaty have the same branding as NASA within their own space administration logos. The activities immediately prior to Operation High Jumped, the formation of NASA and the Antarctic Treaty point towards a huge deception covering up advanced beings, German or otherwise, and the space um, NASA-driven space program keeps the money flowing in to fund an already, uh, an already advanced system in lands down south none of us are likely to ever see. NASA is set to keep the public interest in areas of exploration that simply point, in my opinion, in the wrong direction. To me, NASA is the public face of the wizard hiding behind the curtain. But more than that, it's the theatre of the mind that's been playing out since those secret war battles of the 1940s or late 1940s uh, the government have been calling weather balloons. The amount of money required to perpetuate the NASA-driven space programme is in epic proportions. And yet, all we see are images personally my mobile phone could do better with. So... I'll leave you with my final ends based on nothing more than circumstantial evidence and my own imagination. But, in a nutshell, NASA collects the funds, not for a space race, but for something much larger. A second civilization based right here on planet Earth, populated by some of the world's greatest minds, using all the advanced technology agreed within the real Antarctica Treaty, and maybe even pre-mud flood ancestors, who escaped this to a safe haven, or maybe they were there in the first place, and even invited by the dwellers within Antarctica. There lies in Antarctica, I believe, an Elysium, a Shangri-La, that us mere mortals are not invited to be part of, reserved only for the selected few. And if you think this sounds crazy, then you may wish to take a closer look at all the specialists, the scientists, the engineers, the medical professionals, which have disappeared over the decades since the war. And if you really believe the free energy patents that have been deliberately suppressed by oil corporations, you may want to consider that the suppression could also be from those who, who could be really running this globe from Antarctica, and we would know nothing about it. Doesn't it seem strange to you that presidents, world leaders, religious heads, they all report to Antarctica? Could it be possible we have two contrasting civilizations? And is it possible that our... Our, and isn't it possible that our breakthroughs in technology, especially the free energy ones, uh, have been suppressed and stolen to add to the pool of the technologically advanced race living right here on Earth, as they have done for any number of millennia? It sure seems like there are two worlds. The one we all know, with war, famine and cash is king, and the other we can only imagine, and when we do, we get a glimpse of what may be possible, while it is a reality for the chosen few a lot further than when we were told the Second World War had finished and the Antarctica Treaty basically averted an all-out war that we would have lost in order for the current governments to maintain their power in this part of the globe if we'd left the other ones alone and obviously lots and lots of um, agreements between now and then. 
But you can decide for yourself. But it's sure a hell a busy 1947 as far as I'm concerned of them hitting us. We trying to hit them and them kicking our asses. And then we sign a treaty. And all of a sudden the rest of the world is not allowed to go anywhere near Antarctica. It kind of makes me want to believe that the real war, or should I say the end of the war, came around December the 1st, 1959, when the Antarctica Treaty was signed. Otherwise, I've got a feeling that those crafts that were technologically advanced that could fly from pole to pole as reported by Admiral Byrd, what was reported is the Battle of uh, Los Angeles, again, 1942, Flying saucers in 1947 over Puget Sound, Kenneth Arnold, nine strange flying objects over Mount Rainier, the Roswell incident on July 8th, and then subsequently sending a fleet of 4,000 people to the South Pole all in the same year. It sounds to me like something else was going on and they certainly didn't want the public to know about it and then sealed off the whole area. And I can only imagine that the Antarctica Treaty that was signed was in fact a peace treaty. So did the war end in 1947, as we've all been told? Did it end in 1959 at the Antarctica Treaty? Or did we actually have a third world? Or did it end in the late 50s, early 60s when the treaty was signed? My guess is we fought a war no one was told about, hidden from history and banned from those lands of those who are far more advanced than we. And given the nature of wars over resources in our part of the world, is it not strange that a 50-year-old treaty still remains intact, in effect, broken by no one, when all others have been ignored, deleted and wars everywhere? I hope you found this episode both informative and interesting. If you have, then please share, like, subscribe and hit that bell so you know where my next video is ready. Until then... Believe nothing, question everything, and stay curious.